So Star Trek's cinematic debut was wrought with production problems and scheduling issues, resulting in a film released to theaters. It was not director Robert Wise's intended vision. Vision that would take 43 years to finally be realized throughout the numerous versions of Star Trek The Motion Picture. So being released 10 years after the cancellation of the original Star Trek series, the motion picture hit cinema screens in December of 1979 and was met with very mixed reviews. A lot of people highlighted itself and felt the film had script issues, plot issues, pacing issues. Some people felt the film's length didn't justify the amount of plot it had, but some other critics found it kind of clever and interesting and enjoyable, but maintained a very stark divide between critics, between fans, all that type of stuff, and a lot of that very much stems from the development up to the post-production type of film, which are all very turpent type of things, because back in 1975, series creator Gene Roddenberry pushed Paramount to make a feature film. And unfortunately, after some scripts kind of came, came and went, it didn't go anywhere. They decided, you know, put on the skids, but let's redevelop it maybe for a TV series, going to Star Trek Phase 2. And they spent a lot of money on this entire prospect. They spent about $16 million developing a brand new series that would intentionally launch a brand new television network backed by Paramount. But as you got big films such as Star Wars and Close Encounters of the Third Kind making big money off of science fiction, starkly, right in the middle of developing the series, they changed course saying, we're going theatrical. So after they spent a lot of money, did a lot of stuff with like costume tests, screen tests, casting, all this type of stuff, they had to go in and redevelop everything and rewrite the pilot script for a feature film and scramble along the way to kind of piece things together as they went along. And the film was originally announced to have a $15 million production budget, but once you tack on the development costs from the series and the ballooning problems from the production of the film, ultimately cost about $44 million for them to produce, which still garnered back over $130 million at the box office, but when you take that $44 million and adjust it for inflation to today's dollars, 45 years later, it's about $191 million. So it's very much comparable to any big budget film we'd have produced today. So interesting thing on that regard. But a lot of these problems kind of stem from the fact that everything was just very much rushed. As they got the entire thing where they're trying to redevelop the pilot screenplay into a feature film, they didn't finish redeveloping the script until four months into production. So they didn't have an ending for the film once they started filming it. So there have a lot of things where Robert Wise, greatly acclaimed director, Day of the Earth's Sale, West Side Story, Sound of Music, the guy is just all over the place. He's one of the best directors in the field at that time. But a lot of things just falling behind the schedule so much. He would work very, very much on a certain pace where he wasn't rushing things or something like that. There's a lot of technical issues kind of shooting on the sets and very there's a lot of things all over the board there's like a thousand different things that are kind of slowing momentum and a lot of problems here and there but the kind of the, the biggest type of thing was the fact of the post-production process because the original guys that got involved in the entire thing were robert abel and associates who were much more akin to doing like television scale effects and it was just the fact that they kept turning in stuff that was almost completely unusable just like there's so much money poured into it over the course from pre-production up to about a year afterwards, like up to like early 1979, they'd almost produced nothing that could be used and Robert Wise was not happy and they were kind of using spe special effects master Richard Yurcich as kind of a liaison to kind of keep him up on task. But eventually they fired the guy and his entire team and eventually courted Douglas Trumbull, who had been very much acclaimed. He's the guy who did 2001 A Space Odyssey. Eventually get John Dykstra, who was very much from ILM, fresh off of that and set up his own company, Apogee, to really kind of churn all the stuff out. It was like, it was such a huge workload, and they're locked into a release date. They had to deliver the film on a specific date. They couldn't nudge it a damn inch further. And the fact is, at the premiere of the film, there was never any test screenings for the film, which was very much a thing that Robert Wise always did with his films, always wanted to test it, get some feedback, kind of make some adjustments here and there, and kind of work it out from there. This was nothing. It's like they finished as much as they could up to the last minute, director walked into the screening with a wet film reels under his arm so the thing pretty much got released 
uncompleted. Just like there's just they had to just stop what they were doing. They just couldn't finish everything they wanted to because they had so many storyboards, so much concept art, so many different things. Like there's certain models they couldn't even get built to actually shoot with them. A lot of their shots just could not be realized in the time they had because it was such a heavy workload. Pretty much Robert Wise viewed it as a rough cut film that got released into theaters. Watching the motion picture in the theatrical cut form, as I've already watched all the other different versions, pretty much familiar with the extra footage that does exist out there. Watching it, it feels like a bit of a, a lean film that doesn't quite get all the way to the heart and soul of its own story. I know there's qualities of the film that are there, they kind of percolate, but they don't really kind of boil over all together. They don't, they don't get to their full fruition of examining all the different nuances of the story and having the different qualities of character and elements of theme kind of wrap around as fully as they possibly could. So it's a bare bones sort of presentation of the ideas of the film here as you have this entire thing of all these characters, Kirk and Spock and Decker, all these characters trying to find where they fit in this universe and all that type of stuff and just trying to sort out who they are, what their place is, is there anything more than what they already are, stuff like that. All these things that kind of wrap around the V'ger entity in the film affect these different characters in their own substantial subplots. So I just feel like there's elements there that are, that are pretty much present. You kind of you see them, you kind of get them, but I don't get the, the full feeling, the full emotion of where the film could go to get all those maximize qualities out of those stories there. Now, the theatrical cut we released on home video in 1981 and pan scan on Laserdisc and VHS and many other formats, but finally gets widescreen release 10 years later on VHS and Laserdisc, a long stretch after that until we get DVD and Blu-ray in 2009, but then finally in 4K in 2021, but it's interesting the 4K one because it did some minor changes here and there. Fact is, when you had the entire thing where the Enterprise is leaving space side, there was the entire thing where the crane arm holding of the maw of the Enterprise kind of blacked out part of the space dock. But for the 4K, they kind of crudely changed that, kind of fixed it to a certain degree, but didn't do the best job of it. Everything was kind of like static. They didn't have like moving stars behind the whole thing. It was kind of a crudely done version of the whole thing. And the entire thing where the asteroid blows up in the wormhole, they changed the shot as well. Because originally, as I said, the entire thing was very much rushed and a lot of the effects weren't completely finished. The entire explosion originally did, kind of showed off like the stage backdrop and everything. And so they felt like probably doing the 4K would be a lot more egregious to see it instead of kind of preserving the film as it was. Instead of going in and kind of change it, add Starfield and stuff like that. So some people are a little bit irked about the entire thing. They went in and changed things when we already knew that the 4K edition of the director's edition was being produced felt like it was best to leave it to that team to handle any fixes any type of way. Probably just leave the 1979 theatrical cut as it was, just presented in 4K and HDR or anything like that. So just a few minor things. So if you're looking for like the truest version of the theatrical cut, it's not exactly the 4K version, but also the 2009 one. One thing I'm going to get into here is the fact that the color grading kind of changes here and there from different release. And some things kind of hear more towards cinematographer Richard Klein's actual intention for the film. Some skew away because when a lot of those films hit Blu-ray in 2009, one, they were slathered with digital noise reduction. Very much not a pleasing image in that regard. And they really kind of tweak things to a much more of a colder color hue in the entire thing. So a lot of those films in that era being released on that format in 2009 pretty much had a lot of things tinkered with that were not very much true to how the films originally looked. Now in 1983, ABC had the network television debut of Star Trek The Motion Picture extended by 12 minutes. This was a pretty common practice at the time, have these big feature films, throw them on the network and throw some cut footage back at the entire thing, make it a bigger event, add, add more ad space, filled up the entire thing, just thing they did. It was never really approved by the directors. Like Robert Wise had no involvement in this cut whatsoever. Not the best audio, Color grain's a little bit inconsistent. Like the stuff they put in here, you definitely see on different transfers and stuff like that. It's great much better in different places here, aside from this version, which is a pretty cruddy transfer of a pan scan version of the film. Not terribly good. Now with the complete adventure 4K box set, they did remaster this in widescreen in 4K with HDR grading. So pretty good on that type of thing, but I actually did not buy that box set. So I was kind of forced to watch the pan scan version for this video here. 
and it's a very interesting cut because there's a lot of stuff again when you get up to the director's edition they kind of pull some stuff from this to kind of add more flavor to the entire film flesh out some ideas and there's some other additional stuff in this cut that's interesting and we'll kind of discuss here and there about what kind of works what kind of maybe feels like it kind of just makes the film feel a little flabby in some place here now the first couple added scenes are on the bridge of the Enterprise after Curtis come aboard and he talks with Sulu, check off Uhura about assuming command and he leaves. A little bit of discourse here as Sulu kind of mentions that, well he wandered back, well he got her and then the alien ensign kind of says, well decker has been here through every step of the refit and everything like that and Uhura has a nice little line here. The possibilities of our returning from this mission in one piece may have just doubled. So it gives a little extra context, a little more character, a little kind of graceful transition as you move into the scene with Kirk and Decker in that regard. But after Ilea comes aboard and Kirk gets sent off to the transport room to kind of deal with McCoy, nice little added scene here. It's kind of interesting a little bit. It kind of expands more on the, the sexual prowess of the Delton people and kind of having the fact that Chekhov, Sulu kind of had this sort of a reaction when she's announced on the entire bridge. And just having this thing where Sulu's kind of fallen over himself, kind of being, doesn't know really how to uh, compose himself in front of her. It's nice all seen between her and Decker. They're just kind of a little bit of a flavor to everything in that regard. And they had this extra scene before McCoy beans up and the yeoman kind of says, Said something about first seeing how it scrambled our molecules. So I, I like this a little bit. It's a, it's a nice, again, graceful transition into the scene. Gives a little bit of a levity and kind of sets the stage for like, okay, now we, we kind of know who's coming up. Even though we just had the horrible transporter action with the Sonak and everything like that, it still kind of sets the stage for Dr. McCoy coming on board. So just a really good tag there. I really like that quality of that scene so much that they brought over to the later version of the film. And after the wormhole sequence, as Kirk kind of calls Decker off to his quarters, they have a little bit of a confrontation between them. Nice little reverse angle shot on Ilya. There's a little bit of an extra thing going on. We have Sulu assumes the con, and there's a little bit of just a thing where she's not quite paying attention. She's a little bit wrapped up in the moment and stuff like that. So just a little extra tag here. There's kind of a nice type of beat to have to expand that relationship. But another little thing is after you get the entire thing where Kirk and Decker and all the type of stuff, and... Decker leaves and you have this sort of breaking up of the entire sequence here. Then you come back to McCoy and Kirk. There's a little extra footage, a little alternate footage at the start of this whole thing. And another thing. Get out of your bones. The ship's doctor. I'm now discussing the subject of command fitness. Make your point, doctor. The point, Captain, is that it's you who's competing. You ram getting this command down Starfleet's throat. You use this emergency to get the Enterprise back. Now the next bit of added footage is at the end of the Kirk, Spock, and McCoy scene where Uhura pages Kirk and there's a little bit of an extra dialogue from McCoy that does feature in later versions but there's some rejiggering that happens in the later version that kind of streamlines the scene better but seeing it in this context is kind of interesting. On my way. Jim. How do we know about any of us? And after this is when the Enterprise encounters the cloud. And there's just some array of different footage here when the actual sort of plasma weapon is coming after the Enterprise. And it, one of the things where I do feel like it gets a little baggy. It feels like it kind of cuts down on the immediacy of the threat here when you have just a lot of other chat of different things happening on the bridge between Decker, Uhura, a couple of other things here and there. Just a lot of extra footage kind of poured into it to kind of expand the scene out. Where it feels like if you have much more the immediacy of the other cuts, it feels like a much more pointed sequence getting to the direct threat involved. With it. And the next thing is the fact that after Chekhov gets burned up by the short circuit electrical systems from the plasma weapon used on the Enterprise, I like this scene where they got Ilya coming using her Delton abilities to ease the pain off of everything. It adds more to her character, more about the Delton people. More intrigue overall, just gives more layers to who, to who she is, shows her compassion. Then after this, just a little bit of extra footage here of someone coming in to replace Decker at the tactical station and Decker kind of moving about the bridge and everything, so just a little bit of extraneous padding for the entire scene. And after this, there's a scene with Spock kind of analyzing the signal, realizing they have been contacted, but because the signal only lasts for one millisecond, it runs at one million megahertz, 
they haven't been able to process it. So it adds a little more stuff for Spot to kind of add into his presence, what his purpose is here, to have all these little things that he can decipher and figure out in the mystery of what they have going on here. And it's an additional sort of conversation you have here between Spock and Kirk and Decker here, talking about... We are obviously confronted by a highly advanced mentality. Yet, they cannot understand who we are or what we want. And the conversation goes on with Decker saying, maybe the, the plasma weapon was sort of the thing to keep us away and stuff like that. And Spock kind of analyzing like, I sense no emotion, I sense no compassion, no other qualities that would indicate that. It's much more defense mechanism overall. So it's just expansions on the ideas. And again, what Spock is bringing to the table here, what his sensory is upon everything that's going on here to inform the next decision. So I like those qualities adding back in the story to fill things out more. But now we jump much further into the film after Ali has been taken, replaced by the probe, and dealing with the entire thing where Spock decides to go out in the thruster suit. Now, in the original theatrical version, this was kind of broken up because they had the entire scene in Ilya's quarters, breaking up the two halves of the scene. Well, in this version, this is completely uncut, and it has additional footage of Kirk leaving through the airlock to go after Spock. Now, the thing was, they had an unfinished effects shot because the actual shot of the airlock from outside of the ship was just a scaffold. They didn't finish the matte painting. So, in the original 4x3 broadcast version, had the entire unfinished effects shot. And this was even seen in widescreen and deleted scenes on DVD and Blu-ray. But thankfully, when they did the restoration for the 4K box set, they wouldn't finish the actual matte painting digitally. So you don't have this sort of jarring thing in the middle of the film. It feels all completely seamless in that regard. So it's pretty much nice. And so just the entire thing with the entire sequence from Spock leaving, Kirk falling about, going through the inner chamber, the mind meld, all that's one complete sequence in the special longer version of the film, followed up by extended sequence in Aaliyah's quarters. And then there's a very interesting additional piece of dialogue here between McCoy and Decker, because they're on the bridge, dealing with the feature probe, saying that carbon-based units are not true life forms. Only the life forms, just like V'ger, are considered true. And there's a conjecture here. Some are life forms. Jim, V'ger's saying its creator is a machine. Of course. We all create God in our own image. Now, I do like this dialogue, because I do like the entire thing of we all create God in our own image, because the original title for the pilot episode was In Thy Image. So to tie that back in thematically, I do feel like it just gets there a little bit early. I feel like when you get up to actually revealing that's the Voyager 6 probe, and they're all there, and they're kind of putting the final pieces together, I feel like that's when it kind of fits in. The fact that Voyager would kind of like project its own self-image upon what it believes its creator would be. So that's the type of thing that feels like it would fit better there than it does a few minutes early on the bridge when they're still trying to figure out exactly what the creator is, what it's looking for, and all those type of stuff. So it's a good piece of dialogue. I feel like I get why they cut it from other versions of the film. It feels like it just gets to the summation of the idea a little bit earlier than it should. But there's a nice little piece here. That This is the essential piece. This is both a good piece where the entire thing where Kirk contacts Scotty to order the self-destruct upon his command. I like that because it adds more stakes. It says that if we can't reason with this thing, we can't get to the point of just connecting and putting the pieces together and diffusing the situation, we're going to have to go with extreme measures and blow up the Enterprise with all that matter, antimatter intermix completely combusting. That's the point afterwards, which is the most essential scene of the film to me. And that feels so much from the guys who did the restoration work on the director's edition. It's when Spock sheds a tear and says, it's not for him, it's not for them. It's for V'ger. I weep for V'ger as I would a brother. What I was when I walked onto the ship is where V'ger is now lost, complete without direction. Doesn't know where he fits in, in the universe. This is so essential. This is the thesis of the film here. And it, it's so much that because I feel like this scene, because you have this scene where they're in the sick bay after the thruster shoot sequence, the mind meld or anything like that. 
that kind of gets Spock just about to the end of his arc, this concludes it. This cements it so much that he realized that he's found what he needs, but V'ger hasn't. And he kind of aspires for V'ger to reach where he is now. And it's so much a great, great, pivotal, essential scene that wasn't in the theatrical cut. And that's why the theatrical cut is just lesser, in my opinion. Any version that includes this scene is a superior cut of the film because it gets the summation of the themes, of the ideas, everything like that, with the story, with Spock, with feature, this is the essential scene of that entire arc of those two entities in this film so much. Seeing that he's kind of found his own harmony within himself. It wasn't pure logic. Logic, as he says in Star Trek VI, is the beginning of wisdom. I like that so much. So much that character arc through all of these films is so rich, so d dimensional, and so expertly portrayed by Leonard Nimoy. And it starts so much here with this scene in particular. Now me watching this, all this kind of cruddy pan scan laser, this might color my opinion of the whole version of this film a little bit here and there, because it does kind of feel like, more like the assembly cut of the entire film, because rough cut for the theatrical, this one feels like the version of the film that the editor just kind of threw everything together, everything is shot, all pieces of dialogue, all the scenes are kind of edited together to figure out what you can live without. Kind of find out how you can refine the film, trim it down, make it the best version of it, this feels like it's just kind of a little bit flabby in some places. Some things feel just a tad clumsy in how things are edited together, in terms of like the flow of scenes here and there. Some things, like I said, there are some very essential moments in this version of the film that definitely are picked up upon when you get to the director's editions. But some things feel like it's a little extraneous. Some things don't quite add to the film. They kind of detract in some places and kind of just make the pace in the film lesser than it was already. As people had a lot of problems with it, a lot of people have called it the slow motion picture. Star Trek, the motionless picture. They kind of poked and prodded about how the film is kind of a slow burn type of film. Kind of methodical how it moves. It's not quite as an exciting film as some of the later films of the franchise are. But as so much, it's so much of a character piece and kind of building suspense. Building a mystique. So much of all thing, those things are pretty essential to how the story is told. But certainly there's best ways to do that. And some things that can be kind of trimmed and kind of refined and kind of crafted to a certain degree to make that to the most quality it possibly could get to in terms of how much and how little. But moving forward here, up towards the 20th anniversary of the film in 1999. Now, at this point in time, Paramount is starting to get into DVD, starting to release all the films kind of in reverse chronological order on DVD, just kind of porting over the laser disc transfers onto DVD non anamorphically. And so, not putting a lot of effort into it, but the fact is, as Robert Wise kind of lived with this thing as an incomplete project for so long, and we're up to a point with technology, we're getting a lot of digital effects where kind of just, over the last decade, it's really come along a long way, and realizing that they could probably go back and try to fix the film, represent it the way he really envisioned it, and go up to Paramount to kind of court them to put up the money for the whole thing, the entire project, Gets hit up by David C. Fine, who I've actually interacted with in the past. He actually provided me some information on my Terminator Home Video retrospective video a couple years ago, and he's a very nice guy, very good type of stuff, he's very generous, and just he was so committed to this project because as he started working with Robert Wise, he just created such a bond with the man himself and wanted to see his vision carried along. So they had to go through a lot of work to get to the point of actually redoing a lot of stuff, going back and so much the the storyboards, the concept art, to reconstruct it back to the closest way possible towards Robert Wise's intended vision. They go through a very rigorous process where they didn't get to do it quite as much as they wanted to back in this 2001 director's edition. Because they originally wanted to go through and do a lot of cleanup on the entire print and everything like that. And as you watch the DVD, you can see there's a lot, of, a lot of noise, a lot of speckles, a lot of things here and there, print damage here and there that just didn't have as much time or at least as much money to go through and do that much of a rigorous process on it, but they leaned much more into sound mixing, new effects, re-editing the film, color grading so much, because as they went off and watched the print of the film at the DGA and screened it and saw that Richard Klein's photography was much of a warmer color. And so they kind of went back into this thing and regraded it 
where it wasn't quite as representative in previous versions on home video. They wanted to kind of more closely approximate that with the color grading on the director's edition for DVD. Now, one of the interesting things, because the entire film starts out with an overture done by Jerry Goldsmith, who does one of the best scores I've ever heard in my life. I adore his work for the motion picture here. And it was a thing that Robert Weiss had done before on several of his films, but he typically wanted to have actual stuff on the screen when the entire overture was going along, because the problem was back in the days sometimes that the fact that overtures usually played against a black screen. And the projections gets another thing. There's this long, long stretch of just black leader on the whole film. The thing like, well, what the hell is this? Just chop it off. So even if you ended up seeing like a revival screen in this whole thing years later, or even back in the day, projections might have cut off the overture entirely because it was just black screen. But as they went in the entire version of the film here for this, that you want to put a star field ahead of the film so you could play along with the overture. And furthermore, along that point is the fact that the original theatrical cut was just like white text on a black screen for the opening credits. And they really want to kind of jazz it up a little bit. So put a star fill behind it and they made everything kind of gold for the text because they felt like there were a lot of cold tones in the film, like the fact of the entire V'ger cloud is very cold and stuff like that. There's some other lighting schemes like the transporter room and kind of engineering, not quite as warm in some places here. And so they wanted to have something that felt like warmed up the opening of the film so they chose gold for the entire thing to really give that sort of aesthetic. Now the first set of changes we have here is on the Epsilon 9 station where a lot of the footage is re-edited here like some shots are removed, some stuff is re-sequenced, seems like it's a much shorter sequence overall and the text readouts on the computer screens on Epsilon 9 for the Klingon translations have been removed. Now later on, much more particularly, is the fact that the visual effects upgrades come along in Vulcan because the original matte paintings weren't great, and they kind of showed Vulcan with almost like no atmosphere. It's like all you saw was space and planetoids and moons. In this version, they went back and completely re redid it based on the original concept art and storyboards and everything like that, and did a fantastic digital matte painting for Vulcan that looks so absolutely purely representative of everything we know about Vulcan from like a mock time up through Search for Spock and Voyage Home and so much other stuff later on. And so it's such a great thing how they went about correcting those qualities of the film. You've had a little CGI Spock moving along in the entire matte painting as well. But when you move into Starfleet headquarters, so much has been changed. The entire establishing shot of San Francisco is a brand new shot having new animation, the whole thing. They kind of adjusted the entire matte painting of the entire port there, the entire thing where the shuttles are coming down and Kirk disembarks. And particularly to compensate for the additional shots they added in here, they kind of removed the entire shot of the seal of the Federation on the ground there at the beginning of the entire sequence. But now there's a very interesting continuity fix here because you get up to the orbiting office complex where Kirk beams in, he's gonna meet Scotty, Scotty's gonna bring him over to the Enterprise in the shuttle pod. Well, in the first exterior shot, you never actually have the shuttle pod at the airlock from the exterior. Well, now for the director's edition, they've actually added that in and fixed up the continuity of the whole thing. But the nice little flourish they add after this, when you have the entire thing of Scotty bringing Kirk along the side up to the front of the Enterprise, is that when they have the entire reveal shot, the front on one, and you go to the reverse shot of Kirk, They've added the reflection shot of the Enterprise in there, so both the ship and Kirk are being seen in the same sequence here. Or there's been some criticism over the time, with people not really understanding what the sequence is tending to do here. Because it's so much the thing that Kirk loves this ship so much, and it's him taking in the majesty of the ship that he's loved, that's taking him from one end of the galaxy to the next, and it's just an amazing type of thing to have that sort of Goldsmith theme playing as almost a love theme in that regard for what Kirk loves about the ship. He's so connected to it and he's so grateful to be in the presence of the majesty of the ship again. So it's so much what that sequence is doing is so much giving that to the audience back in 1979, finally being able to see the ship on this big screen and kind of having that vicarious nature through Kirk and the whole thing. And having that moment, adding that reflection in there, it's just a nice little race note of the entire sequence there. Just fabulous type of work in that regard. But after this, you get some of that footage from the special longer version, 
where Kurt goes up on the bridge, talks to everyone, and again leaves to go see Decker, and the entire scene extension there where Uhura is saying that this might have doubled their chances of surviving this entire mission here. So, again, a real essential piece of character work, and kind of setting the stage for all the stuff that's going to happen in a few moments between Kirk and Decker and their conflicts going on in the entire film here. And an interesting removal for the entire film, because there are a couple of removals, kind of trims that are done in the director's edition as well as editions. This is what happens to the entire thing where the transporter accident happens. And there's one little piece of dialogue that some people are a little contentious about having it removed that after the entire thing happens, Kirk says, oh my God. Oh my God. And that's cut here. Because there's apparently an idea while they're shooting the film, not being entirely confident to be able to get every single effect shot done in time, as they would be prophesized to not get done, and felt like if they could shoot enough reaction shots to fill in the gaps if they didn't actually have the special effects to show off, they could at least have the actors reacting to certain things and not show it. And so that was kind of the idea behind that. So Rob Wise just felt like pulling that out of there and having the the scene play between Kirk and Scotty's reaction to the entire thing, just looking back and forth and then going, calling back to Starfleet and everything like that and having that dialogue kind of carry the rest of the scene. That was the intention with that. Now, an interesting correction here is a little bit of a scientific correction is that when they go into the entire, like, recreation deck and they have the entire transmission from Epsilon 9, originally, the guy says that it measures over 82 AUs in diameter. Now, my research says the AU is a measurement of the distance from our sun to Earth. So 82 of those in diameter is gi just astronomically gigantic. And once people kind of figured out their math and their scientific end of things, like, let's trim that down to two AUs instead. The particular trim is uh, just after Episode 9 gets absorbed by the cloud. Originally, Kirk has to say to Uhura twice, view her off. A little bit more of a assertive type of way to kind of kick her out of her sort of like disbelief of what she's seen. They decide to kind of trim that down to just one in this version of the film. But now we get another addition here. A little kind of segue into McCoy's B-Men with the entire Yormoon kind of saying like, let's see how the transform scrambles your molecules or anything like that added it back in. So it's, an, again, a nice little graceful way to move into the scene. Now, as I mentioned before, with the 4K edition of the theatrical, they did a sort of a crude fix for the entire thing of the actual crane armor, the model, the Enterprise, kind of blacking out part of the dry dock overall. This one is much more of a proper fix to the entire thing, which does fall along into the 4K edition of the director's cut of the film. Now, another effects fix here is in the wormhole sequence where they destroy the asteroid. Now, like I said before, when they did some alterations for the 4K of the theatrical cut, they probably did things that maybe weren't the best preservation in that regard. They're trying to smudge over things that probably looked too egregious in a 4K transfer. But in the director's edition, they actually did a much better job of it overall because they went on and made an actual digital version of the Enterprise. And they got the old model out of storage so they could see all the proportions, see how the angles were work on the actual model and match that to what was actually photographed back in the day. And so they created a digital version of the Enterprise and recreated the wormhole effect overall to match what they did back in the day because so much the thing was, they wanted to make sure that every single new effect they did in the computer matched the practical stuff that was done back in 79. They didn't want anything to kind of stand out as it kind of like looked too new and too digital or anything like that. They wanted to make sure that everything matched in terms of the lighting, the angles, the style of the photography, all the different things in terms of the quality of how they put together the effects back then and make sure that the aesthetics for what they're doing now matched what was done back then by such amazing artists such as Doug Trumbull, John Dykstra, and Richard Yersich, so much in that regard. So they did consult with a lot of these guys doing the director's edition to kind of get their input, their insight, and some of their own materials to kind of see how they went about doing those things and make sure they could match what was done back in the day. And so they did a much better job to create a better sequence in that regard of how the asteroid blows up and dissipates the wormhole effect. Now something that kind of adds a little bit extra something to the film. When Decker gets called off to that kind of confrontation between him and Kirk, have Leah looking back very concerned 
at the turbo lift as he leaves. So again, just adding those little things the tell an emotional story between these two characters is very, very poignant. But when you finally get Spock on the ship, you have that conversation between him, Kirk, and McCoy. So both effects additions and some additional footage here because they were looking at where this entire room was supposed to be placed on the Enterprise. Realized we'd be looking over the aft starboard end of the entire ship, looking over one of the nacelles. So they digitally added in one of the nacelles outside the window. And at the tag of the end scene, they add back in McCoy's line. How do we know about any of us? But it's nicely better edited than it is in the special longer version. They kind of put things together in much more of a succinct, pointed sequence in that regard. So I much like this edit better than it is in the special longer version. And now as you get into the entire plasma weapon attack upon the Enterprise here, there's actually a couple of minor trims throughout the entire sequence here that just kind of makes the entire thing a little bit tighter overall. And you get the entire thing of Ilea actually helping out Chekhov after he gets the entire burns on him from the electrical short circuits. But then we get the entire sequence of Spock again analyzing the signal from the cloud, talking about the one milli megahertz, running over only about one millisecond in length. But now after this, we have a brand new visual effect shot because the second plasma weapon gets shot at the Enterprise this time we actually have an exterior view of the thing dissipating before it hits the Enterprise because Spock has now figured out how to send the proper greeting on the entire thing. Then there's some reintegration of footage from the special longer version here where the entire thing of Spock saying there's a highly advanced mentality here and Digger saying there's probably a warning shot put off, all that type of stuff. The little conference between Kirk, Spock, and Decker is reintegrated here completely and there's some alteration of a shot here because originally when Kirk asked for the tactical plot on the viewer just a close-up shot of the viewer but now they've actually done an over the shoulder of Kirk looking at the viewer to have the entire thing here so kind of arbitrary choice in that regard but moving forward here as they're doing the entire journey through the cloud here there was a particular thing where Robert Wise did feel like this needs some trims Ultimately, they felt like they could almost trim two minutes out of the entire sequence between both going through the cloud and the flyover of the V'ger vessel itself. And it was so much a thing like, okay, we could do that, but what about Jerry Goldsmith's music? And they called up Jerry Goldsmith himself. He actually consulted on the entire version of the entire film to kind of re-time his own music. Because even Goldsmith himself felt like probably a lot of the stuff would get tripped at some point in time, so he composed music specifically It'd be very easy to edit overall because it would be whether it is certain time signatures, certain like repeating motifs, you could kind of loop it or kind of cut it down or whatnot. You can transition from one cue to the next very easily. So it didn't create anything too complicated in that regard. It felt like he kind of overscored it to make sure they have enough, but still do it in a way where they could trim it down as they needed to. But now we get the entire sequence of the probe attacking the Enterprise to a certain degree because originally it was just like a flash of light and kind of sound design and stuff like that. But now they've added actually an exterior visual effect shot of the thing approaching the Enterprise and kind of zapping it before it goes into the bridge sequence of the entire thing. So and a little bit of an audio alteration here. Kind of changes from version to version to version here because after the entire thing is the intruders kind of go on to the Enterprise it ends up being the Ilea probe. When they go into Ilea's quarters there, originally there was audio of the entire thing and it sounded like the computer whatnot kind of telling them that the temperature in the entire thing is dropping, 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 dropping. But now it's kind of removed from this version. Temperature at intruder location. Temperature drop rapid now. Six zero degrees. Five. Then you go into the entire thing much later on here. It's the extended version of the probe with Chapel and McCoy inside Ilea's quarters. Just those few extra moments that played out between different characters to give a little bit more motion to the entire sequence there and it's added back in. But again, with more audio changes here, because originally when Spot goes out in the thruster suit, there's all this computer instructions going on in the entire sequence there that they cut out completely. Just threw it all out because it worked completely fine without it because you didn't need it telling you there's a 10 second countdown that once it ignites, there's another 10 seconds, blah, 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 blah. It was very straightforward without it. And then when Kirk brings Spock back aboard after he's gone through the entire mind melt sequence, it's a little bit of a trim here. And the entire thing where Kirk's kind of talking with Spock on the sick bay bed and everything like that, it's a point where Kirk gets a little bit irascible. And then McCoy tries to pull him off 
and it kind of shakes him off and goes back into engaging with Spock again, that's been cut out of this version. I'm fine with it either way. It's not something that makes or breaks the scene one way or another, but I kind of feel like maybe Robert Wise I felt like it kind of broke up the drama of the sequence too much. I want to keep it a little bit more on that intimate level in that regard. So I can definitely kind of see that in a certain way. And there's a, bit, a little bit of trim at the end of the entire thing because originally Kirk goes off and he's talking with people on the bridge and stuff like that and they're kind of asking where Decker's location is at the point in time. This has been trimmed up. They kind of go right from I need Spock back on the bridge to going off and come, going into the next sequence. But here's where the real visual effects money shot comes in because originally they didn't have a full model built to kind of do a reveal shot of Vija approaching Earth. So now in this version they actually have an entire CG model of Vija itself approaching Earth, which just adds so much more to the entire film. So I had this little blip of something on the kind of tactical view or whatnot, they're actually revealing the entire ship in its size and it's sort of menace in a certain way as well. But after this, they start launching the plasma weapons to orbit the Earth. One, they flipped one of the shots over and add some other shots as well. And there's even additional shots of them kind of creeping up over the horizon and stuff like that and circling the Earth overall. So it's a very good work. I'm just very impressed by what they did here to realize that quality. Because everything else in their film, because it's such a massive vessel, you only got these little pieces and everything like that. You can't really form up in your mind exactly the full composition of what it really looks like. To actually have a proper reveal shot of it adds so much more into the meat of the threat of the entire story here, in my opinion. And then Kirk goes off trying to explain to the Vija probe that the carbon units are a natural function of the creator's planet. And while they keep in McCoy's line about Vija believing it's the creator's machine, they cut out the portion of Decker saying, we all create God in our own image. So I find that very interesting, like my comments earlier, but I feel like they maybe follow along the same path of deciding what to cut and what to keep in. And now we get a lot of other stuff from the special longer version of the film, such as Kirk contacting Scotty to prepare for the self-destruct sequence upon his command. Because an additional little visual effect shot here of the Enterprise flying through the interior of Vija as well, that transitions us in the entire thing of Spock shedding a tear. That entire sequence there of weeping for Viger. Absolutely, like I said, it's so essential to the crux of the themes and the stories and the arcs of the entire film. Robert Wise knew that implicitly and put that sequence back into the film. Now from here on out, as we're approaching the interior, the actual internal chamber of Viger, whole new visual effects stuff. Going off the entire thing of new stuff on the view screen and the entire thing of actually Vija forming the walkway up to the Enterprise and they replaced the old matte shots because the old matte paintings just didn't look terribly good. Like the proportions on the Enterprise saucer section didn't look terribly good and just like they, they knew they could make it look better. And at the end of the film, brand new stuff is actually showing off a little bit of Vija himself right before the entire explosion of light and the entire thing dissipates with the Enterprise going off. So it's just like adding the form of the entire ship we got the full reveal of all earlier. It's a nice little added bonus there right before that glowing explosion of light and the whole thing. So as it goes off, just like this was such a revelation. Because even if you had sat there and watched a special longer version, this is everything refined down and having all the new visual effects stuff put in the whole thing to finish what was intended in the original place. It's just a great thing to experience. There was so much a thing when I produced a review of the film several years ago. It was just of me talking about the director's edition. I didn't want to talk about the other version of the film that was done beforehand because I felt like to review the film is to talk about the version of the film the director originally intended and didn't get to make back in the day. So. Almost exclusively, I talk about that version on DVD that was done back in 2001 as my main crux of my review video. But I felt like now, with all the stuff, the brand new 4K edition, all the new stuff they did, it just felt like it was necessary to go through one version after the next to kind of see how it evolved. But as Robert Wise passed away a couple years after this was made, but at least got to live to see a version of the film that he was very much happy with. Even though, like I said, didn't get to do absolutely everything they wanted to do with it. 
on certain levels here. Everything was just done in standard definition. There was no high definition version of the director's edition produced in 2001. And we kind of moved forward through different phases of home video getting up higher and higher resolution stuff. David C. Fine and his team, Mike Medicino, Darren Document, everyone like that, pretty much had the urge like, we've gotten up to a certain point where the DVD looks old and it's outdated. And we really need to preserve this for the future. Get up on the best levels possible, do a full restoration of the film elements and get back to everything and make a brand new Adobe Atmos mix. And so as the years went on, as they were kind of envisioning what they would do this entire project, one, they got more information from archives to inform what they could do with this entire version being upgraded to much higher resolution format. So as they're kind of getting up to pandemic times, announcing this, they kind of have to work through that as well in a kind of a conference sort of collaborative environment when you can't be as much in collaboration with so many people, they very much went through with this thing and it, it's just, it's just spectacular what they did with this thing. Getting up the Dolby Vision grade in 4K with Dolby Atmos, they freaking delivered like living hell. Just, they, they almost like over delivered and every expectation you could possibly have, it far exceeds what they did 20 years ago and it just excels so much overall. Now this new 4K version does maintain all the same edits, the same trims, the same additions, all the type of stuff as they did back for the DVD version. But they went back to a lot of the original special effects elements and recomposited not all, but some visual effects shots. Some stuff that needed some additional work done, some things that need to be a little bit cleaned up here and there, rebalanced in some places here. So some shots have been given a little bit of an upgrade in that regard. But a lot of the other effects work is exactly the same way it was back in 1979. And they did a very particular type of thing with the grain structure on the entire film because as they were reviewing the new 4K scan footage, they felt like the kind of grain structure is very inconsistent from shot to shot. And some things felt very distracting to their eyes. And so they did a very fine process of degrading the film, but then regraining it afterwards, which a much more even grain field they could do artificially. So some people, they were reviewing the entire 4K edition for the director's edition of the film, feel like the 4K of the theatrical cut had a much more of an organic sense about its grain structure. A little bit of its detail in some places here, but this one felt like a much more even field in that regard for the grain structure of the entire film, plus aided by the brand new Dolby Vision HDR grade of the entire thing, which definitely blows away the theatrical cut 4K. It's like this one is very much like rigorously done, because like I said, they got the original notes from Richard H. Klein, everyone involved with his team who were shooting the film and kind of looked about how the film was being lit and the temperatures they're working with and different things. So very detailed, getting all this paperwork of exactly all the little reports they had of how the film was supposed to be graded and shot and lit and all these different things to get down to the very minute details of exactly how to grade the film in this version. So as the DVD version of the director's edition definitely had much more of a, almost like a blanket warm tone over most scenes. This one with the HDR grading, the 4K, they've got a lot more nuance, a lot more detail to go off of. Definitely looks much more refined, much more polished overall in that regard. So the blacks are much deeper. It's like a lot of stuff in the photography really comes out very well with how Klein was using shadows overall and how to create a mood for the entire bridge of the Enterprise and various other things here. So I think the photography comes out extremely well, better than it ever has before with this new grade on the entire film. And with the brand new Dolby Atmos mix, everything comes out so much more crystal clear, much more dynamic overall, from Jerry Goldsmith's score to the ADR in the film, the general dialogue, everything like that, comes out so much better than it ever has before. Lines of dialogue just sound so much better. Just everything's much more well integrated. It sounds more organic overall with this new fine-tuned mix because they got all the way back to the original ADR tapes are done back in the day, so... A lot of places they could actually go back to those tapes, reintegrate it, remix it, and refine it for a better sonic experience overall. Now, the entire thing, as they do upgrades on the entire film here, one is a little bit of a different star field at the beginning with the overture, but then the opening credits get a lot more sparkle to them because it's still the gold stuff, but they put in all this great effect. It has a little gold star sparkle type of thing going off over all the credits. Looks absolutely wonderful, just like it's just so rich in how it's presenting things, but 
get up to Epsilon 9 and get in the transmission for the Klingon ship. Now, as I said, in the original theatrical version, they had some, like, English text on the screen translating everything. But for the DVD Director's Edition, they kind of cut that out completely. But now, they actually have Klingon text on the screen for it. And so they keep kind of altering it here and there and kind of adjusting what they want to do with the whole thing. One other particular trait of this scene going from version to version is the fact that sometimes the computer is doing an audio translation of the Klingon dialogue and sometimes it's not. Definitely in this version, there is no such translation. Getting up to Vulcan here. Again, they redid the entire digital map paintings almost from the ground up. Because they're not exactly the same as they were before. Many of the major elements are still there, but some of the background elements of the craggy sort of rock formations a little bit different and some of the statues are as well but in general it all looks just absolutely spectacular and it's no longer a CGI Spock. They actually got the original plates done with Leonard Nimoy back in 79 to reintegrate into the new digital footage so did a great thing on that regard and we get up to the much more kind of stage shot of Spock and the kind of Vulcan elders they kind of changed a little bit of the Matte or whatnot off to the side, a little bit of the set or whatnot to match the wider shot overall. So, a little bit of alteration in that regard to maintain the continuity overall. And then you get into the entire Starfleet headquarters sequence in San Francisco. Again, they kind of still kept with major, the major changes they did for those shots there, but they kind of did brand new versions of them. But another little effect shot fix they have here is the fact that when you looked at the original theatrical version of some of the shots going across the Enterprise, like the nacelles, the kind of blue screen bleed through came through on the entire thing. And so it was the thing that keeps catching my eye watching that version of the film. For the director's edition, they went in and corrected those pieces of the film. And moving ahead to where the Enterprise actually leaves the dry dock, not only did they fix the entire thing of the crane armor, the model kind of blocking out part of the dry dock there, in the final departure sequence, they actually add back in the shot of the Earth behind the ship, which was not there in the previous versions of the film. Then we move much further along to that conference between Kirk, Spock, and McCoy in that little room there, which was, like I said in the DVD version, they just added the kind of starboard aft nacelle into the entire viewport there, but in this one they actually went ahead and kind of completely replaced the background of the entire shot. Because they kind of figured out that the fact that they thought that as you had the entire thing of the Vulcan shuttle docking with the Enterprise, you had that entire shut out the aft viewport. But well, they now kind of changed the entire room to be the exact same room. And so it's an interesting type of thing because we can get really close up to it, seeing the entire actual live action actors being cut out against the entire new visual effects background. It's a little back and forth about how good it holds up. I understand their kind of ambitions, intentions, and whatnot. I feel like if they kept with the same thing they did in DD version of changing the entire view out the aft port or whatnot, I think it would be just fine, but they got a little bit ambitious in the entire thing. They did the best they possibly could with this entire shot. I'm not saying that's bad, just in the fact that you didn't have all these actors against a chroma key, a blue screen or a green screen, to really kind of have the best element to kind of cut them out and kind of composite them out or whatnot. So just a little here and there about the whole thing. When I'm watching the scene in motion on a big TV from a distance, it's not really much of a thing, but when you look up close and you're examining the whole thing, Kind of comes off in a certain way that feels a little here or there in that regard. But moving off, talking a little bit about the audio in the entire film here, because there's some some alterations in effects, sound effects in that regard. Because there's one thing they wanted for the bridge of the Enterprise to make it sound alive. So they actually added in a lot of the original bridge sound effects from the original series into this Enterprise. You can hear a lot of those sounds creating a liveliness about the entire bridge overall where a lot of other stuff in the entire film before it's a lot of silence. They want to have a little bit of activity in the sound of the entire bridge there so I kind of like that. It kind of it creates that tether back to the original because they kind of brought that back every so often in the original series movies. Kind of harken back to those old sound effects to kind of give that little touch back to where you were before. So I kind of like that element put into this version of the film. But also, again, in the entire sort of point where the Aaliyah probe shows up in the shower, this point in time is actually check off over the comms. It's located in the sonic shower, Captain. Surface temperature abnormally high. 
that kind of gives context back to the other version of the entire thing where the computer was saying the, 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 the temperature in the shower is dropping, dropping, dropping because apparently the probe is so very hot that it's kind of trying to even out the entire thing with the temperature of the shower there. So only other stuff to talk about visual effects wise is the fact that again, just the upgrades overall, just like they're just stunning. The new stuff they did inside V'ger, all those little fly throughs and everything like that, just look absolutely stunning with the, again, the high resolution, the new Dolby Vision grade, all that type of stuff. It just excels so much, gives so much that detail, and that vibrance and that mood and the contrast overall just excels so much. And then redoing the entire reveal shot of features is like, it's just eye popping the quality of what they did here. They did some enhancements overall to the same model and all the type of stuff. It's like, it just looks so goddamn good. So goddamn good. And you get out the entire rest of the film and get up the entire thing where Decker and V'ger are combining and merging into one being. And you got the entire brilliant light show or whatnot. They changed the little thing of seeing V'ger, the vessel itself, right before the explosion. Because before, it's more kind of a, a wide lateral type of thing. You're seeing like the broad side of the vessel and the DVD version. But now, it's much more the head on narrow end of the entire visual that you're seeing in this version. The visual effects upgrades are just stunning. The fact is, the work they did to just make sure they honored the original visual effects of the film. Which you can say, some other people in some other films doing this sort of same sort of special edition upgrade have not done quite as good of a job, if you know what I mean. But just the fact that you get someone like Robert Wise, such an acclaimed filmmaker in that regard, and he wanted to follow that along that same path back when they're doing the original director's edition. He wanted to make sure that they integrate everything that felt exactly organic to when the film was originally produced. This team has so much reverence for Robert Wise and what he wanted to do with this film that took 43 years from its original release up to this one to finally 100% realize everything he wanted to do with this film to bring Star Trek to the big screen in the most spectacular fashion possible. I really do love this film. It's a really fantastic thing. And it's the most unique Star Trek film out there. There's no other film in Star Trek that's like this film. They all went off and did many different types of stories after this, but nothing of this scope, nothing of this ambition in this type of way to tell a story with these types of themes, this type of breadth of intrigue and mystique and all the type of stuff. They always went off and did very interesting things for the most part, but nothing ever aspired to this level of this type of story where just like, I just love the themes of this film so much. How you explore these characters. Kirk, Spock, and McCoy, these types of characters all coming back together. They've been apart for so long. They've changed so much. They're not the same people they were before. And the journey of the film is finding their place again. Where they belong. How to make themselves whole again. They've kind of lost their track of things. Lost their paths. Now as they bring them back together, everything starts fitting back in where it belongs. I like the fact that even the Enterprise itself doesn't work properly until the entire crew is back on the ship. You get that final cargo spot coming back in and fixing the engine problem to make sure this ship runs right. So it's, it's nice little elements like that that just kind of tips off to the themes of the story so much and they come through so spectacularly in the actual director's edition. Now that has all the extra brand new effect shots but you definitely give some credit to the special longer version as well. Because it does have a lot of those extra scenes that fleshes out the characters. And that's what makes the most impact. Is the characters. Their stories. Their arcs for the entire film. And that version does have a lot of those scenes. Has all those scenes. Plus a little extra stuff here that... Maybe not as much in character. Maybe not as much in story. Much more kind of padding the runtime out. But certainly a lot of people do have a reverence for that version. They grew up on that version. Very much like it. They went out and grabbed that big 4K box that they could have the widescreen restoration for it and pretty much have a reverence for it so much. I know I was discussing things with my friend Ewan who helped me with the Highlander videos and he has so much a reverence for that version. He has his favorite version of the film. So definitely give credit to that thing because it created a, a knowledge of so much of that footage being out there that people could say, 
I like that stuff. That adds so much more to the story here. It fleshes things out. It broadens the scope of everything that's going on in the entire film. So it just creates so many eagerness about the entire fan base here to see those scenes and see what the film could have been back in the day and it took a few more steps forward to have the director actually involved to kind of trim down and refine the edit to find exactly what we wanted to and his fantastic team behind him with David C. Fine and everyone else just leading the charge to get the best quality out of the visual effects, the sound mixing, everything like that, going through the right channels, involving the original artists, involved the entire film to make sure they could get the best quality and do the best tribute to Robert Wise possible. So, guys, I'd like to hear what your feelings are about the numerous versions of Star Trek The Motion Picture. Which one you kind of grew up on? Which one kind of appeases your interest in the film overall? And so guys, there's always a super thanks feature here on YouTube to contribute anything monetarily directly to YouTube. There's always a Patreon to contribute something every month. You can really access everything we have here on the channel. But also, commenting, liking, subscribing, sharing links around social media. All that helps to expand the channel, get more eyes here, and make things very healthy. And make sure we continue to make very good stuff and very entertaining stuff here on the channel. For you guys and everything like that. So guys, thanks so much. Take care. Live long and prosper.